From WSNC 90.5 FM, a broadcasting service and NPR affiliate of Winston-Salem State University, welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, reflections on the legacy and potentialities of CLR James, with James Early, Sylvia Hill, Kojo Namdi, and Alden Nielsen. Africa World Now Project is next. Writing in Black Jacobins, CLR James argues that the cruelties of property and privilege are always more ferocious than the revenges of poverty and oppression. For one aims at perpetuating resented injustice, the other is merely a momentary passion soon appeased. The range and scope of the work of CLR James cannot possibly be captured in our limited time with you this evening. However, it is the intent for us to spend our time effectively with you in a way that encourages you to explore the work of CLR James as we hear reflections by those who had the opportunity to work closely with him. The epigraph just cited is one that brings into sharp focus two of Western Europe's deadly gifts of modernity. Its attempt to redefine the praxis of being human as the great thinker Civil Winter has provided a map for us to understand and the justifications for the creation of private property. This thousand year process, according to Cedric Robinson, culminated into a racial capitalist system that feeds off the ideas that have structured our current world as a result of slavery, colonialism, neocolonialism, the salience of race as a cultural ideological class construct, the demonization of gender, and iterations of imperialism has left a deep wound on our collective human consciousness. Next, you will hear in order of speaker reflections on the legacy of CLR James from those who worked closely with him. James Early, former Director of Cultural Studies and Communication at the Center for Folk Life Programs and Cultural Studies at the Smithsonian Institution. Kojo Namdi, host of the Kojo Namdi Show on NPR WAMU-FM. Sylvia Hill, former Professor of Administration of Justice, Department of Urban Affairs, Social Sciences, and Social Work at the University of the District of Columbia. And Alden Nielsen, who is currently the George and Barbara Kelly Professor of American Literature at Penn State University and author of CLR James, A Critical Introduction. This program was moderated in part by E. Ethelbert Miller. E. Ethelbert Miller is a literary activist and board chairperson of the Institute for Policy Studies. He is also a board member of the Writer Center and editor of Poet Lore magazine. He was previously the director of the African American Resource Center at Howard University and former chair of the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. He is currently a resident fellow at UDC, University of the District of Columbia. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Enjoy the program. Pivotal leaders will more than likely be killed with darker pigmentation you become an example of exoticism under that western microscope elements of your identity appropriated and then sold back to you sold back to you with less than clever taglines and for all of it you must smile and dance yeah, keep dancing. Knowing the revenge will taste so much sweeter once you've made it. Good evening. Good evening. Um, it is 
so wonderful to see the University of the District of Columbia uh, celebrate uh, this very, very important uh, figure on the global stage. Um, I'm going to make some comments that uh, hopefully will extend uh, some of the optics that have already been presented about how we might uh, look at the legacy of CLR James. Uh, but let me acknowledge in that regard of legacy uh, that we have, I know, a ethics uh, class here of young adults. Uh, we have a uh, anthropological class here of the, from the University of Young Adults. And I want to acknowledge that because many of us sitting on this panel were somewhere around your ages, perhaps just a little older, when we engaged CLR James. And I raise that such that his legacy uh, is um, really about how you're going to respond, uh, both as participants here at this university and what you do uh, with the kind of posture and constructs that CLR James uh, took forth. Uh, it has been noted that um, he was a world-renowned intellectual uh, on the order of W.E.B. Du Bois, who perhaps was the greatest uh, intellectual of the 20th century in the United States of America, and arguably the greatest uh, among the greatest, along with CLR, uh, of the intellectuals in the Western Hemisphere. It has been noted that he was a Pan-Africanist, uh, that he was a Marxist, um, that uh, he was uh, someone who came from a background of home education. He came from a very well-educated family, not a rich family, uh, so that he had an eye and an ear uh, for the larger epical uh, dimensions going on around him of literature. His mother, uh, it is said, influenced him very strongly in the search for literature. A very important lesson mm -hmm. for you young adults about uh, CLR James and what you might do with your youngsters, that is, exposing them. But CLR had something extraordinarily special about him, uh, given his middle-class background. Uh, he sought the vantage point, the activities of the ordinary people on the pan yard with the Calypsonians, uh, with cricket. Uh, uh, he understood uh, this question of color within, quote unquote, uh, the African diaspora of the black world. He talked about uh, the middle-class brown people of the Caribbean uh, as contrasted with the black-skinned people. Very important political questions that CLR understood. Uh, something that is very resonant today in uh, issues of colorism uh, within the, the black community. Go and look at that literature. He talked about himself as being a black European, something that would grate on many people. What did he mean by being a black European? Well, first he talked about being black, but it was in Europe uh, that he began to look at some of the larger global questions going on, because it was in Europe that he also met the African diaspora. Uh, this is where he met uh, people from all over the black world. He met people uh, from the other colonial areas of Asia. Very, very important uh, to understand that out of his blackness, out of the particularity of his blackness, was the universality. He was not joining the world, he was bringing his particular experience to the world. And this was something that marked James throughout his life. In the question of the national Negro question that had come from the fourth common turn in 1922, uh, brought by Harry Hayward, uh, from the 1928 common turn to the United States Communist Party that black people were a national question, a nation with the right of self-determination. Well, James picked this question up and he said he, we should advocate for the right of self-determination. It's a long history here, but that was different from the slogan of actually calling for a separation. Questions that younger people today should study. As the debate goes on among Marxists, is it class or is it race? CLR James understood the history of black Americans and of black people generally being a particular element of working people because we were mostly the proletariat or working people, but we had special historical development, special historical needs 
that the abstract question of class alone would not uplift. And James dared to stand forth on that. He talked about uh, Bolshevizing Amer uh, American uh, socialism, of uh, bringing a particularity to this country. Something you need to look at because he was always ready to stand against the current. Even as he embraced uh, Nkrumah and even as he embraced Walter Rodney, he was not above racing and embracing critique to say where he thought they needed to continue their work even as he embraced them in solidarity uh, and in brotherhood. Very important, this intellectual mind of his, his willingness to step forward and to be a dissenting voice without trying to become a kind of individualized figure. Still, our James was very, very accessible. Uh, there is someone in the audience tonight who owns his typewriter, who he just, uh, who would go to see him at the at the Chalstedton. Uh, there is someone here tonight who used to go to his apartment and help clean up around and talk to him. Ethelbert and I would go and do these interviews. Unfortunately, I was unable to pry uh, out of the Afro-American Studies Department at Howard University the three videotape interviews that uh, Ethelbert and I did with CLR. Uh, on one morning, we went to see him. We knocked on the door. There was no response. We knocked again, and there was a faint voice that said, come in. We entered his apartment at the Castleton, and there he was lying in bed with the covers neatly folded up to his chest. I have a photograph of this at, at the house. It looks like he is dying. And we walk in and we said, Professor, uh, we, we had the video camera already. He said, are you okay? He looked up at us and he said, I have a lecture to do this evening. Do you mind? I want to conserve my energy. Do you mind if we do this interview while we lie in bed? <laughs> uh, he was a very, very precise man. I first saw him uh, after I had been kicked out of Morehouse College and I was uh, picked up by Vincent Harding at the Institute of the Black World in Atlanta, Georgia. And he was giving a one-day seminar, and I forget the theme of it, but he spoke that morning. We took a lunch break, and then the, when the afternoon session started, a young man came in and stood forth and raised the question, and CLR James said, obviously you were not here this morning when I made a very important statement about that very issue that you have raised. He would walk into a room and he would look at his watch and he would say, I'm going to lecture uh, for 33 minutes. And uh, he would start, or uh, 35 minutes, or 43 minutes, he would start, and boom, uh, 33 or 43 minutes, point made, summary complete. He had that kind of precision uh, about him. During his days here at the University of District of Columbia and teaching at Howard University, the Caribbean Unity Conference was in motion. This was a period of great activity in the Caribbean of new visions about uh, a post-colonial look, uh, Grenada uh, emerging uh, in this time, the New Jewel Movement, um, left-wing scholars, Walter Rodney, a number of people in the Caribbean. And of course, this was reflected at Howard University. Every Friday afternoon, you would go out, and at, on, the, on the steps of the library, it would be full of Caribbean students talking politics. Uh, this was a period in which Leon Condron Damas, one of the three founding figures of Negritude from French Guiana, was also at Howard University. There is this great photo of CLR James uh, done by Roland Freeman. Uh, CLR is standing at the chapel of Howard University against that, that rolling granite uh, with a hat like this brother has on and the, sitting right here on the back row. He, had, he, had, he, he, he was a very handsome man. And, and, and it was one of the first times that I, as a male, could say, wow, this is a, this, this is a really, really handsome brother. He had this, this, this video. So when you think about CLR James, look broader than the fact that he was black or that he was a Pan-Africanist. Look at his notes on uh, dialectical and historical materialism and humanity, or his notes on dialectics, or uh, the independence uh, movement of 1933 in the, in the Caribbean. Think of him as others have thought of him, not only in the context of the great black figures of his time, but also of Antonio Gramsci. Uh, he, uh, he, is to, he is to be put on that same level of bringing cultural studies. He asked Ethelbert and I on leaving one afternoon uh, as he wanted to find some, uh, some uh, uh, VHS, I think they were, on 
British literature, and he said, can you find that? And we said, well, you know, we'll look into it. And then as we were leaving, he said, so who is this Alice Walker, and who is this Intazaki Shange? He was a man always embedded in the context of his time, and that is a legacy. And the question before us today, particularly the young adults in the room, will it be your heritage, which is what you select from legacy, to put into your life, not just what he left in general, but what you will take up for him. And as an organic intellectual who rose to be a giant on the stage, always tied to ordinary people, I think that is a very important lesson for the young adults in the room. Thank you. Good evening. I was fortunate enough this past Thursday to hear on Ethelbert Miller's radio show two of our panelists this evening, both of whom are CLR James scholars. James Early is a scholar, and of course, Dr. Sylvia Hill is a scholar. I am a talk show host. <laughs> and <laughs> Ethelbert is a lot of things. <laughs> And so I cannot give you a scholarly overview of CLR James's work. What I can give you is what a well-known now deceased Washington poet, Gaston Neal, had a poem called Scattered Pieces of the Action. So what I can give you in terms of my personal experience with CLR James in Washington is scattered pieces of the action. I got here in 1969 specifically to attend this new institution called the Center for Black Education that, as you heard earlier, had grown out of Federal City College to establish itself as an independent education center in the community we were located at 1435 Fairmont Street Northwest in two houses that we had put together to create a school. And just down the street from us on 14th Street was Drum and Spear Bookstore, which was affiliated with the Center for Black education, and ultimately Drum and Spear <coughs> Press. It is in that environment that I got to first meet CLR James. One of the fascinating things about all of these photographs that you'll see of CLR James is that they don't reflect how exactly how tall <laughs> and stately he was. He was about six feet five inches tall, <laughs> despite the fact that he towered over everyone else in the room. When you first walked into a room and he was sitting, he would look like a small person until he stood up. So that was the first thing that struck you. And I had heard, being from Guyana, about CLR James before I had left Guyana because in the Caribbean, cricket is an extremely popular sport. And CLR James had written a book that even today is considered the most important cricket book ever written called Beyond the Boundary, about a sport that even though many people around the world did not understand, when they read that book and they saw it within the social and political context that he put the sport, acknowledged that even though they didn't understand the sport, they could understand the importance of his contributions and this book. So I met him at the Center for Black Education where, despite the fact that his classes at Federal City College were often crowded, the Center for Black Education was a fairly small institution, and on some nights, especially when it was cold, the classes were not very large. CLR is the first person I heard say, if there's more than one person here, we have a class. We have an audience. It didn't matter to him. One of the interesting things about him that you'll hear tonight is just how accessible he was. Despite the fact that he was so world-renowned, you can almost always, as you'll hear later, pick up the phone call him and arrange to have a conversation with him. And what he did with us was expand our worldview. When I came to Washington, I had left the Black Panther Party in New York <coughs> because I thought the Black Panther Party was going communist. And I was a confirmed black nationalist who didn't want anything to do with communism. So I came to Washington to the Center for Black Education because it was going to establish itself as a pan-African organization. And here was I sitting, listening to one of the, essentially the founders of the Pan-African movement, C.L.R. James, who was a Marxist. <laughs> and what he helped us to do was to understand, first, that he supported us, that he was willing to listen to us, and that he was willing to talk to us, that 
all of the militants that we associated with black nationalism was something CLR had no problem with whatsoever. And he introduced us to a broader worldview that included notions of class that we did not at the time quite understand. But he also taught us that if you're going to look at the world, you cannot only look at the entire world through the lens of race. Race is very important. Black nationalism is very important. Your rebellious nature is very important. But you've got to learn to look beyond that. And he was tolerant enough of us because we thought we had revolution made. We thought that after a few, <laughs> after a few summertime urban rebellions, we thought that we had revolution covered, that we were bringing revolution to the United States, and that we knew what we were doing, and he knew that we didn't. And that, however, that our hearts and minds were in the right place, and if properly shaped and directed, we, can, we could understand the world a lot better than we did. And it was very important that he was here for those years, 1969 to 79, and was so accessible, because it was like CLR was in the air around us. He influenced all of us. You heard mention that Leon Damas was on the campus of Howard University. And he can't be here tonight, but Acklin Lynch was around Washington at that time. So for those of us who were black nationalists trying to understand and develop a more international understanding of the world, the mere presence of those people in our midst, the mere accessibility that we, have, that we had to those people helped us to understand ourselves, our origins, our African origins, our contemporary situations, and where we could go better. We had, as I said, the notion that we were about to bring revolution to the United States. We did not know how much we did not understand. CLR helped us to look, study, and understand what we did not understand. A lot of us started studying historical and dialectical materialism, studying Marxism and Leninism in order to develop a deeper understanding of how societies were formed and a deeper understanding of classes, even though we clung and still cling today to our African heritage as a guiding source and inspiration for everything that we do. But CLR had gone through all of that, had seen all of that, and had formed a great deal of it. We would not be able to do that had he not done what he did in the past. And yet here he was every single day willing to guide and to teach us. And it had a significant impact on the entire anti-establishment movement in those days in Washington. But you know, CLR, a lot of people took everything CLR did so seriously that they didn't realize that CLR had a lot of very interesting habits. CLR loved watching soap operas. <laughs> He loved watching, and when you would ask him why he watched soap operas, soap operas tell you something very profound about the American system and about the American life. But he was not going to miss his soap operas once he was at home on any given day of the week. The man's interests and knowledge encompass so much that those of us who had the fortune to encounter him or to benefit from his teachings while he was here, it affected us for the rest of our lives. And all you have to do is Google CLR James, and you can extract just about anything he has written. Before he left Trinidad in 1932 to go to England, and then he, he lived in England from 32 to 38, came here from 38 to 53, and during the era of the persecution of communists, communists and the McCarthy hearings, he was forced to leave the country and go back to England. He came back here to teach at Federal City College and later the University of the District of Columbia, but he brought everything he learned in all of those experiences here with him, and we today are the better for it. What he knew, what he understood, and Sylvia Hill will tell you more about his relationship to the Sixth Pan-African Congress, because without him, the Sixth Pan-African Congress would not have happened, yet he didn't participate in it. But that's, that's, that's another, another story. But he has made an impact on us for the rest of our lives, and that's why we are here tonight to tell you about that and hope that after we have spoken to you yourselves can investigate CLR James and understand the contribution that he made to the world and the contribution that he can still make to the world and to you. Thank you. So I've been asked to focus more on CLR and activism, my activism. And, oh, okay, and I will try to do that quickly. 
in the interest of us having some time to have a dialogue. So I first met CLR when I visited the Center for Black Education in 1968-69, and I was introduced to him by Jimmy Garrett, who I had known from San Francisco State, who I had known from San Francisco State, and um, who was now um, or a part of the Center for Black Education, along with many San Francisco State people and even some people from Oregon. So we had a particular kind of experience when we met CLR James that CLR James found very interesting. Uh, first of all, the West Coast activism was very much dominated by the Black Panthers and their struggle for justice in the context, particularly of California. In addition, we had experiences there organizing black studies, first at San Francisco State, and then at other universities, UCLA, uh, as well as Pacific Northwest, and some of the predominantly white institutions where we didn't think we could get black studies in because we didn't have any black students. We had to wage a struggle to bring black students. So, for example, at the University of Oregon, we brought in what was 75 black students, and it was called Project 75, and then 50 um, Hispanic and Native American students. And so we forged a struggle there. Uh, for them to be successful in engaging. So we had all of those kinds of experiences. And I guess the one thing I want to point out is that CLR was keenly aware that we had had a certain level of experiences in struggle. And he really respected that in our challenging institutions. We also had experiences in real serious violence, where particularly by the state and particularly by the police, um, we already knew what it meant to be infiltrated by law enforcement, federal, state, and local. We already knew what it meant to have people assassinated who you knew. We already had the experience of um, infiltrators to your group who were attempting to derail whatever your objectives were and push you in a more radical uh, stance that really would lead to <laughs> arrest and incarceration and perhaps death. So we'd had those experiences. And at a national level, you know, we had all seen the assassination of King, the assassination of the Kennedys, the assassination of Malcolm X. So I cite all those things because this was a period of struggle um, that was very intense. And it was for a considerable period of time. And so when we met CLR, the question was, what do you do with that? What is the problematic? How do you fit into that struggle? And what do you do with that struggle? Uh, and, you know, one of the lessons of CLR was that you had to always figure out what your problematic is, a good Marxist term. But other people might talk about it as interest or passion. But we were trying. <laughs> to figure out how do you make change? How do you make systemic change? And by the time we met CLR, we had read Fanon, we had read um, Marx. Some of us had participated in study groups. Some of us had you know, incomplete knowledge, certainly compared to his. And he was and reveal your light away All this time I've waited so I can keep back
You are listening to Reflections on the Legacy of CLR James by James Early, Kojo Namdi, Sylvia Hill, and Alden Nielsen. This program was held last week, October 22nd, 2019, on the campus of the University of the District of Columbia, UDC. Formerly known as Federal City College, CLR James taught there starting in 1968, where he wrote a series of works on culture, politics, radicalism, and revolution. In order of speaker, we are listening to James Early, former director of cultural studies and communication at the Center for Folk Life Programs and Cultural Studies at the Smithsonian Institution, Kojo Namdi, host of the Kojo Namdi Show on NPR WAMU FM, Sylvia Hill, former professor of administration of justice, Department of Urban Affairs, Social Sciences, and Social Work at the University of the District of Columbia, and Alden Nielsen who is currently the George and Barbara Kelly Professor of American Literature at Penn State University and author of CLR James, A Critical Introduction. This program was moderated in part by E. Ethelbert Miller. E. Ethelbert Miller is a literary activist and board chairperson of the Institute for Policy Studies. He is a board member of the Writer Center and editor of Poet Lore Magazine, former director of the African American Resource Center at Howard University, E. Ethelbert Miller is also former chair of the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. He is currently a resident fellow at UDC, University of the District of Columbia. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, African, and Afro-descended communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Continue to enjoy the program. Giving us a kind of perspective that was holistic uh, and yet also offered guidance about what is the nature of the struggle for you at this moment in history. One of the um, important things that the SNCC people brought to, I think, the struggle was the pedagogy of the oppressed. In their efforts to lead campaigns for the vote and to prepare people to vote, they had to figure out how do you teach people who are not used to reading? Uh, How do you teach people so that you empower them, not make them feel more insignificant because you had more knowledge than them. And so that was a very important um, kind of knowledge base that the SNCC people brought to the Center for Black Education and wherever they went because they brought that knowledge base to San Francisco State from the experiences of some of the SNCC people who were now students there and at the University of Oregon. The, I point that out because one of CLR's great strengths was treating people as equals, equals and intellectuals but also offering information and guidance for critical development without disempowering you, making you feel like, well, I would never know this. He will only know that. And that's a very important part of being an organizer. And in our organizing around the Southern Africa Support Project, we really worked hard to figure out how do you create experiences so that ordinary people will feel a concern and passion for the people of Southern Africa and will understand the nature of U.S. foreign policy and its impact on the oppression of that set of people, just like there was an impact of oppression on black people in the United States or poor people in the United States. And uh, Seller was fascinated with those kinds of discussions and we had many of them. 
Another aspect of uh, Silara's teaching was that a lot of people talk about Marx and talk about change, but they aren't given to action. And um, he was very strong on figuring out action but always studying your action to see whether it was consistent with the objectives that you had outlined. And so he had kind of a style and methodology of work uh, that we found that was very informative and really helped in our mobilization efforts. He came to many meetings uh, between 78 and 80, uh, and he sat in the meetings just like everybody else, and. You know, we worked through our agenda and we worked through our various conscious raising strategies because that phase of the movement, that's where we were. We were just trying to get people to understand the word apartheid, right? Do we talk about it as racism? Do we talk about it as slavery? I mean, how do we get people to even know this word? And it took considerable discussion and time to um, work on that. Um, he was very um, critical as well. You know, as he told me one time, I had nerve enough to argue with him. I'm trying to remember what I was even arguing about. But he said, are you touched in the head? <laughs> you know, I just will never forget that. I said, no. <laughs> but he was very, uh, very uh, critical in that kind of way too with people he felt were his peers as such. Um, I wanted to uh, also just tell you a little bit about the Six Pan-African Congress. I see one of the important leaders of that, my mentor and leader, Cortland Cox, is here too. But um, I really started working with CLR on a consistent basis around the Six Pan-African Congress. And this was um, following in the tradition of the five other conferences, congresses organized by Du Bois and Sylvester Henry Williams. The, the central idea of the Congress was to create a kind of organizational infrastructure for science and technology center in Africa that would draw on the knowledge, technical skills of black people worldwide. And um, some 3,000 or so scientists were organized in one way or another to be supportive of that effort. In addition, we uh, wanted to have um, create a venue where a large number of black people from around the world would understand the struggle against Portuguese colonialism, Rhodesian apartheid, Namibian, uh, South African Namibia apartheid, and South African apartheid. And again, coming out of that SNCC experience, they knew that in order to build that kind of solidarity and momentum, people had to feel some connection to Africa beyond just hearing about it. And so that it was key in our logistical organizing that we carry as many people to the Congress as possible. So we had people from um, Pacific Islands, the Caribbean, US, Afro, Brits, and so forth. Um, it would take all night for me to talk about that and all their problems, and I see I have a couple of minutes. But one of the points I wanted to make about this is that CLR, well, 
As the Congress began to formulate, we learned an important lesson. And that is the difference between states and people, <laughs> right? We were a collection of people, and we were dealing with nation states. And nation states began to put pressure on Walimu Nereri, who had really, when you think about a president of a country, investing his belief that we could actually pull this off, you have to say, wow. And um, so some of the Caribbean countries said they would not come if radicals from their countries were allowed to come and have delegate status, that they were oppositional forces and they weren't going to acknowledge them. Uh, President Nereri conceded and they were not given that status. They then refused to come. And Silara said, I will not come. So that is why he <laughs> did not attend the Congress. So I said to Silara that I felt like I was betraying him because I can't even tell you all the efforts that went into trying to derail this ever even happening but that um, because I was going to go and take this delegation, get the delegation there. And Selar made a very important point. He said, you know, whenever you do something, you don't do something else. Yeah. Or if you don't do something, yeah. you do something else. Right? He said, you have a commitment to more than 200 people, many of whom for the first time in their lives will see Africa. And for you to not try to make that possible and go, go through with that commitment will have repercussions, political repercussions, that will be devastating in a way that, you know, my loyalty would never ask you to do that. And so he said, um, he, this is what he would do when he was through with something. <laughs> you, know, you know, that meant I'm through with the discussion, we're done. And I, you know, I support, I support your decision. And so he did. But the other thing I want to tell you just in closing Isselar had a very human spirit, and um, woman, child, or man, he really treated with respect. And um, there are children now who are grown and have their children that Isselar, they remember him fondly because he would take them to eat pizza, and um, he would feed them. He got them to eat anchovies. And they all said, I don't know how we ate anchovies, but only because he asked us. And uh, they all have very fond memories of him, and so do I. And I think that um, it was a life experience to know him and to have his instructional friendship. Thank you. Um, even though we have so little time, I want to start by saying just how deeply honored I am to be here tonight um, as a graduate of this place, or if not this place, of another place that became this place. <laughs> yeah, because some of us know this place was supposed to be downtown. Uh, if you're old enough, you used to get, see a subway stop that said Mount Vernon Square, UDC. What's there now? Not UDC. But we are here. They didn't, they didn't put it over in Anacostia after all. I don't mean in the original. I mean, later on, there was a plan to, after this was already here, to put it in Anacostia. Not that Anacostia didn't need it or wouldn't you know, benefit from it, but uh, like so many other things. Big mall. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we need our malls. <laughs> Washington Post, 1981. Quote, the ambassador from Zimbabwe was late to Cyril L.R. James's lecture. It's the only place I've ever seen his name written that way, Cyril L.R. James. 
lecture Tuesday evening. The program began anyway. Midway through, the microphone was still not turned on, and James, 80, failing in voice but never in things to say, was barely audible. The lecture was interrupted so the technicians could tinker with the microphone. Meanwhile, the ambassador from Zimbabwe arrived and was introduced to the couple of hundred people in the audience at the first congregational church. James got the microphone back. Mr. Mugabe, he said offhandedly, was never late. <laughs> 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 now, those of us who were in uh, CLR James's classes knew you were never late. Okay. Um, he was the author, after all, of a lecture called You Don't Play with Revolution. And, you know, he was fond of, uh, always with a smile, talking to us young revolutionaries about, you know, you know, you couldn't really show up two days late for the revolution. <laughs> but that, you know, we, we, we didn't learn never to be late because he would berate us in class or because we might get a bad grade. We, we were always on time because class was always going to start on time and we didn't want to miss anything. You know? And that's the way it was with CLR James, whether it was a class, whether it was a lecture, whether it was a political meeting. Um, you know, you learn very quickly <laughs> to be on time and he was always on time. Um, it's very hot up here. As I was reminiscing to Ethelbert, we didn't have heat at Federal City College. <laughs> wasn't in the budget. <laughs> and you young folks need to know we walked to school because <laughs> there was no metro. <laughs> they did actually finally open the first leg of the metro. And just as UDC was supposed to have been downtown, that first leg should have been over in Anacostia. Right? But as uh, us old folks know, the first leg ran from DuPont Circle to Judiciary Square, which nobody in Washington, D.C. could actually pronounce. <laughs> but it was the end of the line, so you knew to get off there. And it got off right across the street from the second in E location of Federal City College, which people called the shoebox. Uh, some of you who are, by the way, I'm, a, a, I'm actually younger than Ethelbert by 50 minutes or so, so I'm, uh, I can talk about, he knows more things than I do, but those of you who are around our age or the next generation um, know that this building was a temporary World War II building. There were so many of them scattered around DC, there were even some on the mall in those days. Uh, and after uh, UDC got this campus and people moved out of second and E, that became Mitch Snyder's uh, homeless shelter which I thought was telling us something, <laughs> but I was never entirely sure what. Um, someone uh, give me a nine minute warning. Starting now, I won't count the two minutes I just took. Okay. <laughs> um, I officially, I think, was in three classes, African revolutionary movements, in which we read things like uh, Julius Nyerere's Uhuru na Ujama, uh, Latin American intellectual history, uh, in which we read Castro's speeches. In all of these uh, classes, I wrote papers on uh, writers, Wole Soinka in the first class, uh, Latin American poets in the second class. And as the only English major in any of these classes, you know, I was like the jewel of CLRs. I remember when we had to do proposals for papers, and I said, Wole Soinka, he said, I would love to have a paper on Wole Soinka. Um, but in any given class, the contemporary would always come in. Whatever he was working on politically, philosophically, would always come in. Uh, and so, for example, the call for the Sixth Pan-African Congress uh, did indeed come into our class, which is why I still have a copy of this document. Please note the return address up there in the corner. Temporary Secretary, 1802 Belmont Road Northwest. Um, I can't remember if that's the exact, there was, a, there was a Belmont pizza place on that corner at one point. Um, yeah, and on this particular page, you will see uh, what, what Sylvia Hill was talking about, the proposal for a science and technology center. Um, but as she mentioned, um, things took a turn. This is the copy, the cover, of, I'm sorry we don't have a better copy, but this is the Xerox that CLR passed out in class one day. I don't have a, uh, the original to make a, copy, a new copy of. Um, we're, people, people have mentioned the Chastleton apartment several times. Uh, there's so many things to talk about, you know, the, the complete linen over the door, which I thought was going to collapse on him someday and kill him. Um, the way he would constantly send us across the street to Trios to get a... a, a <laughs> A grilled cheese sandwich and a Heineken. <laughs> and the fact that, I don't know if the, how long, at least on one of my visits, there was actually a copy machine sitting on the table. Okay? And uh, he would either, I think what happened was he would make an original copy there, bring it down to second and E and get the history department or poli sci department staff to make these copies. Typically, CLR would come into the classroom, followed by uh, a, a, an undergraduate student carrying a big pile of books, bristling with papers, marking the pages he wanted to talk about, and a pile of these sorts of things to pass out. This is uh, the original transition, not the reboot that uh, Henry Louis Gates and Oxford University Press uh, brought out. And this, as you can see, is October, December 1974. 
Um, and it's a wanted poster, missing from the 6th Pan-African Congress, CLR James, age 73. Description, Pan-Africanist and revolutionary. Alias is J.R. Johnson. That was just one of many aliases. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love this. Last occupation, midwife to the 6th Pan-African Congress. <laughs> The identification marks are texts. George, this young man coming to you, do what you can to help him. He's determined to overthrow the European, to throw the Europeans out of Africa. This is a letter that he writes about Kwame Nkrumah to George Padmore, the former Malcolm nurse, who James, of course, had known in Trinidad previously. On my only trip to Ghana for the Pan-African Literary Forum, I got to go to Nkrumah Park. And there in the museum, you see Kwame Nkrumah's furniture from when he was a student in Pennsylvania, the very furniture on which CLR James sat to have this meeting. I don't think the FBI knew about him yet, <laughs> to have this meeting with Kwame Nkrumah, and then to send this introductory note uh, over to England with him. Uh, the second identifying mark um, is a quotation from the Black Jackets, and this says, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, last scene, going the other way. <laughs> uh, the article itself, is by, by uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce this name properly, by Kisoji, did you know? I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name. Um, State Exhibitionists and Ideological Grammar. It's a critique of exactly the issues that Sylvia Hill was mentioning there, um, the way that there was this tension between the now independent nations and their desire to send official delegations and their desire not to have the unofficial, more radical delegations arrive. Uh, but as she said, that wasn't the end of it because uh, also passed out in class, um, I have no idea who Jacob Johnson was, he wasn't the father of J.R. Johnson, or who, I've never dialed this phone number to see where it would go. <laughs> he, but I, that's not, in fact, uh, CLR, if you know G CLR, you know that's not his handwriting, because his hand was like this in those days. <laughs> Towards the seventh, the Pan-African Congress passed present and future by CLR James. And this appeared in the, uh, the journal Chindaba, uh, this is, I think, issue number two. Um, and a typical in James fashion, he starts with the wide scope, as he does with Black Jacob, and the first part is simply titled, The Decline of Western Civilization. And then he goes through the history of the Pan-African Congresses up until the sixth, uh, particularly spending a lot of time on the fifth Pan-African Congress. Um, then he talks about the problems around the sixth Pan-African Congress. Uh, and then we have towards the seventh. He says, the last thing I want to do this evening, again, this was a transcription of a talk, as was typical of later in C.L.R. James. Having talked about the past to speak about what I believe is the next conference that we're going to have, that we must have. Now, as it happened, there was a seventh. It wasn't quite what C.L.R. James envisioned, obviously. Um, he says, if we are talking about the elite, then we have to be concerned about the masses of the population. The masses of the population, they matter in a way they might not have mattered 25 years ago, and so forth. Um, so this was all going on while we were students. Um, as I said, in any given day, you don't know what might have appeared in the classroom. Um, we, we heard some references to recordings. Um, I can't remember a single day when people didn't have those early cassette recorders in there. You know, those of us who were taking college statistics in those days arrived in class early, not because we were afraid we were going to miss something, but so we could sit next to an outlet and plug in, you know, <laughs> plug in those, those old Texas Instruments calculators and so on. But there was always, someone always had a cassette recorder of some kind in those classes. And again, probably those tapes became mixtapes for their girlfriends or boyfriends later on, but um, I really, really hope and pray that a couple of those might have survived. Uh, no matter how bad the sound quality is, we might be able to preserve them today. And there were constant visitors. You know, any Caribbean writer who happened to be visiting was likely to show up in, in class. I remember the author of the year in San Fernando uh, just walked into class one day. None of us had ever heard of him or of his book, but C.L.R. James in typical fashion had him stand there for several minutes while he explained who this gentleman was and so forth. Um, I'm going to very quickly, before we run out of time here, um, just go back in time to show you some artifacts to show you that um, James had been doing these things all along. I, uh, I, I probably should have started in Trinidad, but I, only, I knew I only had a few minutes. But um, if you research those early journals that he helped publish and in which his early articles and, and uh, uh, short stories appeared, they're, they're well worth your while. Um, when he gets to England, of course, first he goes up to Nelson Lancashire and he's working with um, uh, 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 Louis Constantine on his autobiography. Um, that's when he becomes uh, a Marxist through his contacts with the, the British working class and through his uh, cooperation with uh, Larry Constantine. Uh, but in London, he's already at the very heart of an anti-colonial movement. Uh, there were very few black people in England in those days. Uh, but you know, if you look at the list of the people he was working with, it's astonishing. Amy Ashwood Garvey, uh, the very young Jomo Kenyatta, who, to tell the truth, C.L.R. James didn't think all that highly of. Um, and of course, Malcolm Nurse, 
George Padmore shows up. And as James uh, describes at several points, he'd been hearing about this fellow for so long and uh, was excited to meet him. And one day, there's a knock on the door, he opens the door, and there's Malcolm Nurse, who is, in fact, the George Padmore that he'd been hearing about all this time, uh, who has just left the Communist Party. Uh, this is a copy of the front cover of volume one, number one, of the International Journal of African Opinion with its model, Educate, Cooperate, Emancipate, which is very close to the mottos of uh, James's later political groups in the United States of America, the Johnson Force tendency, as they were known. Um, you know, at first, James is part of this uh, very small group that is formed for the defense of Abyssinia uh, in the lead up for World War II. And if you've read much, you know that uh, James and these other people actually were thinking of trying to form some sort of military group to go over there and fight in that battle. Uh, even then, it's hard thinking back to that time, but it's hard to imagine the CLR James of the mid-1930s actually being a soldier uh, in Abyssinia, but I'm sure he would have given it his best. He probably would have been an officer very quickly, knowing him. Uh, but that eventually becomes a, a broader um, uh, African anti-colonial movement. In addition to this journal, there were journals like The Keys. You'll see this one is July of 1938, by which time he's publishing uh, Black Jacobins uh, and other texts. So, you know, when he, when he goes to England in a suitcase, he already has the life of, uh, of Captain Cipriani from which uh, there's some misunderstanding about this. The case for West Indian self-government was actually a chapter in that book, uh, fleshed out a little bit. It wasn't that they tried to condense the whole book and get rid of the biogra biographical parts. Uh, but Leonard and Virginia Woolf and the Hogarth Press published that, showing these intimate connections between James and, and uh, emerging modernism in, in uh, Anglophone literatures. And if you see those early letters James pu published back in the Trinidad newspapers, I think they're just called Letters from London, you see how Intimate, how quickly James became an intimate part of the uh, literary and philosophical scene of England at the time. Um, he comes to the United States. There's a great deal of controversy over the consider over you know why he comes and how he comes. But he originally comes on a speaking tour, and here you see the Boston Guardian, January 21, 1939, article: C.L.R. James gives good talk, <laughs> which he always did. Um, in his reminiscences, he talks about how at, at home he would practice giving these speeches. And by the time I knew C.L.R. James, uh, I never saw him actually with a written text. He had lots of texts around him that he would call upon for quotes. But James was one of the, you know, call him a Victorian, whatever you want to say. James could speak in entire well-formed uh, paragraphs uh, at exactly 43 minutes <laughs> with no need for revision whatsoever. And people could take these down, and they became published lectures at one point or another. But that's because of these years that he'd had of experience. He was one of those uh, speakers in the park that you hear about in the 1930s radical uh, England. And when he comes to the United States, he begins doing the same sort of thing. Um, as many of you know, he leaves the United States for a little while, goes to Mexico, and has these famous conversations with Leon Trotsky in which he transforms the whole Socialist Worker Party line on the black struggle because James is impressing upon Trotsky the, the idea of the autonomy of the black struggle. And this was something the Communist Party itself was not really going for. I only have one minute. Um, you need to understand the international importance of this man. And I'm going to go quickly to something that doesn't happen until the 1940s. Um, people get mad at me for talking about C.L.R. James in relationship to things that come later, like post-Marxism and post-humanism and so forth. Uh, but all these movements come out of the developments that you already can see in his work in the 1930s and 1940s. In the 1940s, there's an organization in France, socialism, I can't speak French, I'll say it in English, socialism or barbarism. These are copies of their journal. Out of this group comes Guy Debord from The Situations, comes Jean-Francois Lyotard, the author of The Postmodern Condition, comes uh, the regrettable sometimes, uh, what's his name? <laughs> the guy who writes about Vegas and all those other things. Um, whatever his name was. Baudrillard, thank you, Jean Baudrillard. Um, Cornelius Castoriadis, the great French philosopher, and so forth. And in almost every issue of their journal that you can find, as you will see here, they're republishing documents from C.L.R. James's group in Detroit. They were in intimate contact. And when they fell apart, they were falling apart over the same issues. They were having exactly the same debates at exactly the same time and splintering over the same issues. You'll see, um, uh, where is it now? Uh, da, 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 da. Documents, the American worker by Paul Romano. Uh, Paul Romano was a member of the James's political group named Philip Singer. They all had <laughs> pseudonyms. This is partly because of Brian Dyskaya's uh, uh, Russian paranoia, I suppose. Um, that document, if you ever see it, the entire document, The American Worker, is co-authored by Rhea Stone, who in fact was uh, Grace Lee Boggs. 
And so you see right there the kind of thing that was exciting the group in Paris because the American worker is a pamphlet in which you see an American worker talking about the day-to-day -day activities on the shop floor wedded to the philosophical, political critique and study of a Grace Lee Boggs. I'm probably at 11 minutes now, but uh, this is James in the classroom, the aforementioned Leon Damas. <laughs> That's it for Africa World Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email AfricaWorldNowProject at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist Moiza Matali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent Funda Ngunda, senior research, content contributor, and production director Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, senior researcher and content contributor and production associate Dr. Josh Myers, associate producer and content contributor Dr. Keisha Khan Perry, technology advisor is Byron Gray of Grayworks Technology, and creative director is Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project is heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC NPR affiliate and broadcasting service of Winston-Salem State University. Shows are archived weekly on SoundCloud. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. There goes the presence. Oh, the presence now.